Well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, it gives me the great honor to have Laura De Benedetto on today. Um, I have pronounced that right. She's nodding at me. Thanks, Laura. Um, Laura is a TEDx speaker. She's a number one best-selling author of The Six Habits and Life Mastery Coach. She's known as America's Happiness Coach. And uh, Laura is all about living our dreams without sacrificing what we love. Laura was also the is also sorry the founder and CEO of a, a massive advertising agency called Vision Advertising. Um, sorry, marketing company. Do you know what? I'm going to start again. All right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Start again. So hello, lovely listeners. Uh, it gives me the great honor to welcome Laura De Benedetto today. Laura is a, a TEDx speaker. She's a number one best-selling author of The Six Habits and Life Mastery Coach. Laura is also known as America's Happiness Coach and teaches people how to live our dreams without sacrificing what we actually love. And Laura is the founder and CEO of the award-winning marketing company, Vision Advertising, which I believe, was this the one that you had from age 19, this company? Oh, it is, right, okay. So she, um, Laura built this from the age of 19 and I think handed over the reins two or three years ago um, in terms of having a less active role because obviously you're, it seems to be that you're concentrating now on your, your being an author, being a, a speaker and being a coach. Okay, cool. So thank you, Laura, and welcome. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for spending time with me. No problem at all. And where in the world are you, Laura? I'm in Florida in the United States. Nice, cool. Um, so Laura, I always um, have a, a sort of similar format with these podcasts in as much as the listeners love to know people's stories. And in particular, you know, your backstory and how you went from, you know, childhood, teenagehood, young adulthood to the, the success that you are now and obviously any trials and tribulations that you faced along the way and any pivotal moments, you know, where you really found yourself just completely changing your life. So we'd love to hear more about you, Laura. Awesome. Well, I would love to tell you, um, hopefully interesting stuff. So, uh, my journey, uh, to be who I am today and where I am today, uh, is actually a lot like other people. Some of the details might be different, but I grew up in a humble family home and, um, as a little girl, I was taught that it was better to be seen and not heard and to behave and be pretty and all of those things. Um, I didn't fit in. I got picked on when I was a kid and I found myself in an abusive relationship when I was um, uh, like 18, 19. And I started a business, didn't fit in in the employment world. So I was like, well, I better start a business because then I know I won't be fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, ultimately we all have a strong survival instinct and that's really what I focused on. I wanted to be loved just like everybody else. I wanted to be successful just like most people. And, um, I managed to do some really interesting stuff. So when I was 19, I started, uh, the marketing company. It's still going today. It's uh, celebrating its 22nd year. Wow. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it I never thought I'd be saying that also like, when did I get to be 41? What happened? <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> um, so I did a lot in the years from 19 until now. And ultimately I wanted to um, build a business that would allow me to be financially comfortable. And I, I really, uh, I got really super excited about Robert Kiyosaki when I was in my twenties, you know who he is? He's the rich yeah. dad, poor dad guy. Yeah. So I was a big fan and I was like, yeah, passive income. All right. <laughs> of course, did I know what I was doing? No. Um, I made some huge mistakes with real estate and, uh, lost my shirt and that sucked really hurt, <laughs> but I learned quite a bit and, uh, but I never let go of that whole passive income thing. So, I, uh, I retired when I was 37, um, not as rich as I wanted to be, but I retired from uh, the responsibilities, which was awesome. And uh, I just didn't want to actually do it anymore. And um, the interesting thing about the whole retirement was that while it's notable, 
I, I felt I was just really tired and I was really burned out. And, you know, retirement is supposed to feel, supposed to, right? That's what we think. It's supposed to feel amazing. And wow, I've done it. You get to, you know, ride off in the sunset on your horse and you're the hero of your own story. It didn't feel like that even remotely. Um, and I just wondered what went wrong and what I wasn't understanding. So I started studying human behavior and what makes people happy because I wanted to be happy. And that's what put me on the crazy path that I've been on for the last couple of years. I changed my own life so massively as a result of the, um, the work that I did, but also the research that I did um, that I, I couldn't help but want to share it with others, which is why I wrote the book. So I went from being negative, angry, physically sick, because stress will actually kill you. Um, and it was on its way to killing me um, to healthy, happy agreeable, positive, courageous, and uh, wealth is much easier to, to have and manifest and priorities have changed. And I'm, I'm probably the most awesome version of myself that I've ever been. And that was the main thing that I, that I was able to engineer for myself. Of course, I wanted to share that happiness is extremely contagious. And um, what's been really nice is to see so many of my clients and my readers over the last couple of years become more courageous and finally like take the risk and pursue the dream and start the business and just do the big, bold stuff that we dream of, but often don't do. And, you know, we, we soften our hearts. We, we get, you know, more kind and um, it, we start to see our things, you know, our dreams come true. And I've been watching and reading the stories of my readers and my clients their stories of transformation. And it is like, this is the stuff that dreams are made of. It's not just my own life getting good. I mean, yay, that's wonderful from a selfish perspective, but actually making a damn difference in this world and seeing so many other people living joyfully and with intention. That's like goosebumps material. <laughs> it's so cool. Absolutely. Can, can I ask, um, before we sort of um, focus more on what you're doing now, you mentioned when you were you weren't cut out for employment. What does that mean? What did that feel like to you all those years ago? Um, wow, you're asking me to remember back to the dark ages. I don't know if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, what it felt like is square peg round hole. Like I'm just a very rebellious person. And there's a lot of people like me rock walking the earth who, when you tell us do that if it seems dumb, then I don't want to do it. I yeah. want it explained to me. And there's, there's a surprising amount of people that need to be given the rationale for doing something. And then once they're given the rationale, they'll do it. Um, I was very young. I was like, you know, 18, 19, no sane person at 40 that I reported to wanted to give spunky little attitude me the rationale for anything. They're like, because I said so, that's why. And I'm like, well, this sucks. Um, I don't belong here because I'm not going to be attaching my lips to your behind um, and going along with this because this feels stupid. So I'm out. I'm going to go build a company filled with logic and respect. Peace out, homie. So I left. <laughs> And, and how did you, you know, because you were really young, how did you make that happen? How did that dream vision start and, you know, and all the bits that you need to actually start a business? How did that all come about? I want to preface my answer by saying there's something remarkably motivating, but motivating about having a rent and a car payment and a desire to have food in your stomach that will motivate you to do things you didn't think you had the courage to do. So I had bills and I did not want to live with mom and dad. And it was like, I better go out there and sell. And sales, as uncomfy and weird as it can be, is what made me actually be able to eat and have clients and grow a business. Um, turns out one of the most valuable skills I've ever picked up in my whole life was the ability to sell things, sell an idea, sell my husband on why he should want to do the dishes. You know, <laughs> sales is important, right? Um, 
hey, dear nephew, you should eat your broccoli because let me convince you in five easy pie charts why you should do this. <laughs> but like sales, sales is basically the short answer. So, you know, did I really know what I was doing? No, I was 19. I was rebellious. You really think I was going to take a class and like entrepreneurship and business startup get serious? No. Like I've always been the person that's like, I like to do things my own way, even if it's not the way it's my way. And that's fine. So when I was 19, I was like, well, I need money. So I'm going to see if I can sell stuff so I can have money. That was literally like, that was the complicated equation. Y'all that was it. Like I need money. I'm capable of doing something. Let's see if I can get someone to pay me to do it. And I knew how to, um, to do marketing, I've always understood it. It's just one of those things where like, yes, it can be taught, but also if you inherently get it, that really makes sense. And it's just, you know, all my, you know, my grandparents and all my, uh, my, my parenting um, support systems, everybody was an entrepreneur and in sales and striking up conversations was easy for us. Marketing, I always understood. So this was obvious for me. Um, and uh, I was like, well, let's give it a shot. So I went out there and I was like, hi, can I build a website for you? I don't need a website. You sure? Can we talk about it? <laughs> like never employ these sales strategies ever, <laughs> never. Um, they will work when apparently you're 19 and cute and somebody has a soft spot in their heart for you. <laughs> but, you know, competency showed up and I put my all into everything. I remember one of my very, very first projects I ever did is I built a website for a motocross retail store um, and they sold all kinds of neat motor motocross stuff. And the job that I had like one of the last jobs I had was GM of a motocross track. So I just knew networking, but I didn't know that it was called that. And I just called some people that I know. And they're like, well, yeah, yeah, you could use a website. And like, I remember I charged 600 bucks. That 600 bucks was like life-changing, life-changing. Because first of all, it was like an entire paycheck <laughs> from like what I was getting from my job. I mean, keep in mind when you're like 19 years old, 600 is like a lot of money right? Yeah. And it was, I don't, and like, I remember like I had to learn things and teach myself the job. And it was like, can, do you know how to do this? Yes. And then I go home and I'm furiously Googling it. How do you do this thing? <laughs> you know? And, um, a lot of fake it till you make it a lot of, absolutely. I'll figure it out on the way out of the airplane. Like, I don't know, but I don't know. It's just, you have to believe that you're capable of being uncomfortable and rising to the occasion. And it's like, I did that and I, I was forced to grow a lot as a person. It's amazing because, <clears throat> you know, if I think about my 19 year old self, I didn't have half of the self-confidence you clearly had and self-belief actually is probably the, the main thing. Self-belief is a big thing, I think for a lot of women, but you, um, you seem to have just had it, you know, you just had it in, innately. Or I was hungry. Mm. One or the other. And I, I do mean literally, like <laughs> you have to pay your bills. Like it was like, <laughs> I'm not moving back in with my parents because then that would make them right. Right. Okay. And I can't let that happen. So you're, <laughs> so you're quite headstrong and stubborn as well then. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I feel so bad for my parents and every gray hair on my mom's head and all the hair that fell out of my dad's head. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so you, you start, you taught yourself, you started to make some money, hunger drove you, and then it turned into what it's turned into. So can you tell us a little bit about how that sort of all unfolded over the years? Sure. So once you actually figure out how to sell, and the easiest way to sell, by the way, is to just serve um, and ask really good questions. It's not the answers you give. It's not your flip chart. It's not your PowerPoint presentation. That's not what helps you sell. What helps you sell is listening and like really intimately understanding, um, the problem that your prospective buyer has. So I got really good at that. And I, and the thing is, I'm sure you've heard this before. If you want to be rich, do what other people are unwilling to do. Mm -hmm. I cold called till I was hoarse got on the phone, filled up my schedule with tons of sales appointments. I drove all over my city. And, you know, there was a tipping point where I had sold more than I was capable of delivering. Mm -hmm. That was a wonderful tipping point because that is when I created my first job and I got to hire my first employee. Um, and I learned how to manage also how not to manage. And, um, 
But the thing is, if you have orders that exceed your capability, but you can add humans um, who can expand your capability and you can actually fulfill on it, then you grow your company. And that is what happened. Um, it, it's really not a story of glamour. It was literally outselling my capacity. That is what um, allowed my company to grow. So it's funny, like I've been counseling companies for the past 22 years um, through the marketing company, but also through the coaching and consulting that I do now. And they're like, well, how do I go my company? Build demand that exceeds supply, period. Your prices can go up and you can add people. It's not complicated. People make it complicated. I don't want to sell. Well, have fun being poor then. Yeah. Like get over it. If you want money, if you want to actually build a company, you want to create jobs, you want to serve as many people as you possibly can, you must sell. Sales are the lifeblood of a company. And um, I'm not going to tell you it was always fun. It wasn't. I mean, I had a lot of sales calls where I was sexually harassed by someone that was older um, and um, just really inappropriate. I've, I've had older women bully me because um, they were jealous. I've had people like be very overtly ageist, which is not really something you think about in entrepreneurship, but I was a very young entrepreneur. So I faced it a lot at 40. I haven't faced it in a while, but I remember getting the ageist treatment, um, you know, and, and people bullying me on pricing just because they think I was just a sweet, you know, girl next door type of girl that, you know, would just easily fold like a wet tissue and, yeah, you have to learn boundaries. You have to learn this. You have to learn that. You have to learn, you know, when to bend and when not to bend and how to construct things that actually work for you, your clients and your employees. And oh my God, what a journey. What a journey. No wonder I was tired at 37. Like I, yeah. I laid on the couch. I was like, yo, I need like a year's worth of naps. <laughs> I was going to say to you, how did all that come about? I mean, was it a case of your body was just telling you, you had to stop or your mind yeah. or, or both. It was all of it. I yeah. mean, my brain was starting to get like, I mean, I was starting to get really crabby. You know, I was, I was conducting myself in a way that I'm really not proud of. Like I'm a really nice person. You know, I'm very outgoing. Um, I don't stab people in the back. I stab them in the front. It makes me real fun to be around, but like, <laughs> um, you know, I just, I was very stressed out and I, I don't like how I was treating the people that I uh, was responsible for. And I didn't like myself. I didn't like how I was treating my husband. And I just, I stopped liking me. Um, and uh, that was really a big wake up call. I was also sick. Um, and I was finding myself in the emergency room a few times um, with uh, really profound anxiety attacks that I thought were heart attacks. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really, uh, it was really important that I paid attention. I mean, you know, our bodies communicate with us all the time, mm. but we ignore our bodies. And I did for many years. I actually started to feel like crap when I was about 32. So I started to look for a solution, but I thought I had more time. I was like, oh, I'll be fine. No, I wasn't fine. Like I, I you know, I wanted to retire with a lot more money than I had. Um, yes, I did build a passive income vehicle, but it wasn't giving me as much as I wanted. Um, but I also realized that the ultimate, um, measure of wealth is how much time you have and what the quality of that time looks like. It's like money is great, but time is the real thing that humans have. Cause money is just an idea. It's a fine idea, but it's just an idea. And, um, my time was not joyful. My time was filled with pain, frustration, self-loathing. And, uh, I knew that needed to change. So, started looking for a solution at 32, found it when I was 35, and then fully executed it when I was 37. So what were you looking for at that time? Were you looking for somebody that could help you through it? Or were you looking for an exit out of the business? What, what did that look like for you? I was looking for an exit. I was looking for um, what the right exit plan would be. So um, when I was 19, it didn't even occur to me. Like I was like, what's an exit plan? Yeah. Like, I didn't know. I, I didn't know anything. Of course I didn't because God forbid, I actually take mentorship from someone. Right. But as I, you know, went throughout the years, I actually helped a lot of people to develop their exit strategies. I do a lot of that now, probably more than I've ever done. And I started working on my exit plan at 32 and realizing that, wow, I need to get out, but there are multiple ways to get out. I could quit. I could sell it. 
I could allow, you know, I could do a merger. I could do something where I just stay on in a part-time capacity. I could sell equity. Um, I could just, you know, I could do a lot of different things. I could sell it to the employees. I mean, and ultimately I had to just sit with it for about a year um, to arrive at a really good decision that I felt really resonated with my head, my heart, and my wallet. And um, ultimately what I decided to do was to sell 49% of the equity of the company and uh, about 95% of the responsibilities to um, a person that I feel like I could trust. I, um, <clears throat> I started to go down that path with someone who was, you know, supposed to be earning equity and, um, you know, coming on to actually assume a minority partnership, but um, that person did not work out. Um, but then I found the person who did. And, you know, it was discouraging. You know, I felt like I was getting royally screwed over and it was just really stressful. Um, but then when I met uh, Julia, the woman who runs the company now, I understood why it didn't work out with the first one. I was like, oh, I got it. I was very, very clear at that point. And although it had a false start, I was able to find um, someone who has the same integrity that I do, um, who wasn't burnt out the way I was, and she was able to run the company in a way um, that kind of complemented a lot of my weaknesses. Um, and I was able to complement some of her weaknesses and together we could do a great job. So I told her when I brought her on, like, your job is to fire me, get yeah. me out of here. Like I, I, I'm running out of gas at a, at an alarming pace. Um, and I remember one day after just being extra grumpy, she's like, we really need to get you out of here. <laughs> I know, <laughs> like I am a liability at this point and I'm aware that I am a liability I don't want to be here anymore. Like I'm burnt out. I can't do this. Um, so <clears throat> we worked very, very hard. I was actually um, planning to retire. I, I left um, basically at the very beginning of 2018, I began um, doing, uh, I just turned 37. I, uh, I began doing like maybe 10 hour weeks and then just reducing it down to like five hours. But even then, when you don't want to do something, that is onerous. I was like, I just, I can't with this. And then when I finally just like let go of all of it, my God, it like, it, it, it just, it merely made a thud. You know what I mean? It just like, it dropped like, you know, like Atlas finally getting the world off his shoulders. Like I felt everything come off of me and I finally had some time to breathe. But then, you know, I surveyed all the damage that I had done all those years to my body, my mental health, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, wow, don't see how else I could have done it differently, but um, glad I left when I did. Mm. Wow, okay. So clearly you've got no regrets about that exit. It was something that you needed very much. Um, so, so how did the coaching and the, you know, the TEDx and the writing the book, how did, so you, you, will, you, you alluded to it earlier, you sort of, retirement wasn't all of a sudden oh wow this is amazing you realize that there needed to be something more or something different so how did it come about um a lot of things in life actually come from pain yeah I, I get asked the question a lot of like well why did you write the book you know or like what's a great source of inspiration for people well if you're pissed off enough anything can be a great source of inspiration and, and I was just really really mad um, which seems odd, but I was mad because I'd worked so hard to get this thing. And then by the time I got it, it just felt like such a hollow victory. Right. So I got really mad. Um, and I was sitting there just feeling really sick, angry and uh, like all the crappy things. And, um, I started just wanting desperately to do, to feel better. Right. The, the funny thing is sometimes we're only willing to do something about our situation when we actually hit bottom. And I, I hadn't quite hit bottom, but I was getting there very rapidly because my health was deteriorating, deteriorating really quickly. Man, that's a hard word. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I just, you know, I was just kind of having like a huge wake up call. So, um, you know, I went to the doctor, I had some blood work done and all this other stuff. And it was actually worse than I thought. Um, like, oh, God, 
All right. Well, can't ignore this. I can't just wish this away. And this isn't going to be like a manifesting thing. I can't just sit on my meditation pillow and make this go away. Like this is a fundamental problem brought on by stress. So, um, you know, I started looking at, well, uh, I'm not happy at all. I should be supposedly, but what do happy people have in common? Because whatever it is, I don't have it and I'd like to have it. So, um, that's how I opened my Ted talk. I don't know if you've seen it, but like, it, it really is that question. What do the happiest people have in common? Um, and it's not, that they have a lot of money. It's not that they're sexy. It's not that they've, you know, like retired. It's, it's actually how they think. And my thoughts were really polluted, like super negative. Everything was just bad, really bad. So, um, I started, uh, studying human behavior, I'd always really enjoyed um, personal development books, but I started doing like a major cannonball in the deep end of that pool and reading even more and pulling out my old books and just looking at scientific studies of human behavior. And I, I started noticing patterns and, and that's really where the book came from was noticing the patterns that I wanted to find for me. So I wanted to figure out like, well, what are these things that, that I need to become so I can actually be happy? because nobody told me these things. Um, so I was like, all right, well, these are my theories. I found these six things. And I think that my theory is that if I change the way I think my habitual thought patterns in these six areas, theoretically, I should be exponentially happier, but it must be a default. So I started studying habit and all that other stuff. And, um, I was able to prove my theories uh, through myself and also through some people that I was just like, Hey, you know, I'm on this anti-misery project. Want to, want to give it a shot, <laughs> like see if it works. It might be a total waste of time, but like, let's give it a whirl. A couple of my extremely um, pessimistic negative friends were like, yeah, all right. Sure. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Real buy-in. Woo. But you know, it made them feel better and it made me feel a lot better. And I started just changing from the inside and like letting things go and I don't know, just like sleeping better and just having a very different perspective. And uh, it was by virtue of me becoming an organically happier person, not like artificial or going from high to high of like, oh, I won this thing or I'm going on vacation. And like, it's just a series of highlights, like genuinely to my core, more fulfilled, more satisfied, more courageous, more uh, sovereign, I guess. Um, th through that, um, I, couldn't help but want to share it. I was like, you know, if I, uh, if I share this with others, maybe other people don't have to feel the pain that I felt. Maybe, uh, if, maybe if I put this into a book, um, other people could do this and they don't have to necessarily do the research that I did. Cause I kind of felt like I had, uh, stumbled on the Holy grail. I still feel that way. You know, it's like, if you can master these six things, I don't care what self-help book you pick up after you do the work in the book that I've written, it will work better. It will feel great. And it, you'll actually be able to enact the lessons. The reasons why a lot of the self-help books that we pick up don't do anything. It's not just because we don't actually take the advice, but it's because of the way our thoughts are shaped um, when we interact with that information. So if you change the way your thoughts are shaped, uh, like across the board in these six areas, um, you become a different person, you're more sponge-like. So if you wish to be richer, you can. If you wish to be thinner, you can. If you wish to do bigger, bolder stuff, you can, but it's all like how you think. So, so what are the six areas? And if you could just give us a couple of things that, that would get the listeners knowing what you actually mean by shaping your thoughts. Sure. So um, the I'll, I'll kind of walk you through these in like a kind of like a story type of fashion, I guess. Yeah. Um, it, it, you ever look in the mirror and you're like, oh God, you ever do that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Can you uh, for a moment possibly conceive that perhaps that might not be helpful to your life's trajectory? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, what, what that is, is um, that's the way you treat yourself. The way you treat yourself um, it, it really ultimately informs what you believe you're capable of and what you do. So if, are you a mom? Yeah. 
Okay. I'm, I'm guessing you probably don't look at your kids and go, ugh, right? No. Thank God, <laughs> right? But you do it to yourself. Um, now, if you did that to them, uh, you know, you'd be a horrible person. But if you do it to yourself, you're like, oh, it's fine. Yeah. Meanwhile, if you were to treat yourself the way you treat your children, you would automatically just accomplish much more in your life just by one virtuous change, right? Because you would be treating yourself with nurturing love. You'd be like, you know, oh, you gained an extra 10 pounds. Well, you know what? That's okay. Because you can do anything and you're beautiful and I love you. And you would say that to your child, wouldn't you? Yeah. But you don't say that to yourself. Most of us don't, right? Yeah. The, the pivotal change that I experienced, you can experience, anybody listening to this can experience, is having your automatic behavior when like your treatment of yourself, and this is just one of the areas, to change from that kind of toxic crap of, ugh, I don't look so good, or oh, I can't do this, or oh my God, this is so hard. Why am I so stupid? You know, we treat ourselves so poorly. And if we, if we change that and we make our automatic default behavior, I cannot emphasize default enough. If we make our automatic default behavior one of nurturing parent of kindness, we're going to have our own personal cheerleader in our head. There's a reason cheerleaders, aside from being pretty, are on the side of the football field. It's because they're cheering people on. Come on, you can do this. Yay. They're not, I mean, have you ever seen a cheerleading squad being like, you, you suck, go home, you bug. <laughs> right? No, no I'm a terrible that, cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go fight when you loser. Like it's not gonna happen, right? And like when we put it in this context, it can seem really silly, right? But I put it in this context on purpose because when we realize the absurdity of what we're doing, then we can have a moment with ourselves where we're like, wow. I am actually a vicious bully to myself. Why would I allow a vicious bully in my head when I actually prefer the cheerleader or the nurturing parent? The reason why is because you've been conditioned to do it. Your own mother probably taught you to do it because her mother taught her to do it and so on and so on. Society teaches you to do it. Uh, life teaches you to do it. Bosses, peers, whatever. And also women to women and men to men and whatever. But unkindness is what we are taught and conditioned into from very, very young, right? And oftentimes we learn uh, to be brutally unkind to ourselves, not by, what, not by what our parents say to us, but what we can see that they say to themselves. I remember watching my mom, poor mommy. I remember her being on a permanent diet my whole childhood and looking in the mirror and giving herself insult after insult after insult. I watched that and I learned that lesson and I learned to do the same thing and I had to unlearn it. My mom didn't want to be this way. She still doesn't want to be this way. But now that she's conscious of it, you know, it, it's an opportunity for her to change it, right? And now, you know, you and I talking about this, anyone listening, when was the last time you insulted yourself? Was it five minutes ago? Was it this morning when you put on your pants and maybe the quarantine 15 turned into the quarantine 30? Like, we have these opportunities and it's like self-awareness is a really powerful step. So the, the, the six areas, <coughs> excuse me, are the way we treat ourselves, how we feel about ourselves authentically, uh, how we perceive life. So it's perception. Uh, it is how we choose to arrive into life and experience it. Um, how we allow energy in and how we push energy out. So the six tidy little names for these are kindness, acceptance, gratitude, presence, goodness, and intention. Cool. The titles are nice and tidy and the words seem really simple. Mm. But when I, if I had led with the word kindness, you'd be like, oh, whatever, I've heard of kindness before. And immediately your brain would switch off. Be like, yeah, 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 I know this, I know this. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you're not kind to yourself. But if I frame it as you are a jerk to yourself, why aren't you a nurturing parent? Instead, you're a vicious bully. That tends to resonate a lot more. So that, that's why I led with the story that way. Yeah. Um, how we treat ourselves is kindness, right? We need to be kind when we think we don't deserve it. We need to be kind when we're in a, in a situation where we have to face something scary. We have to be kind when we're just 
you know, vulnerable when we just get out of bed and our makeup is down to our chin, you know what I'm saying? And like, when we need love the most from our parent who is not parenting us anymore, we need to be our own parent. Yeah. Make sense? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of um, self-development myself and uh, the inner, the little child, the inner child is something that always came up for me anyway. And for a lot of people, because, you know, like you said, we are given um, the wrong teachings I don't know whether that's the right thing to say because you know our parents were parented the way they were and their parents were let's call them destructive teachings it doesn't mean that they were wrong but yeah it's what they knew and people actually unconsciously teach more than they consciously teach yeah yeah you know I it's crazy like just people who are around me in person uh just even friends They learn a a lot about self-confidence, even without me saying a word, because they watch what I do. They absorb how I conduct myself, how I stand up really tall. And I, you know, I get comments from loved ones, new friends, whatever. Wow. You have a lot of confidence, man. I hope I could be like you someday. And I'm like, well, you're absorbing a lot. It's like, I feel so much more confident when I hang around you. Aha. And then eventually, you know what? I've become a more confident person. Just, just knowing you. Ah. So leading by example. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I've done, I've done a lot of work myself. I'm not perfect. It's, it's, it's an ever evolving, you know, you're shedding the layers, yeah. shedding the layers, et cetera. And there's no destination, like there is no destination in any part of um, life. You know, the, I think the reason why you felt so empty as you probably already know is because that was the destination, but it didn't feel like you expected it to feel. And, you know, right. and, you know, and, and obviously you'd burnt yourself out as well, which wasn't helping. But mm-hmm. but so many people do that. You know, when I get there, I've made it. When I've done that, I've made it, you know, mm-hmm. and it's well, yeah, when I lose the 10 pounds, then I'll be happy. When I have yes. children, then I'll be happy. Once I get this promotion, then I'll be happy. Instead of, you know, I could just be happy now. Yeah, exactly. I could. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so you you wrote this book um became a number one bestseller where where would people find it on amazon i guess and it's on amazon actually um i was thrilled to discover that my books have traveled to countries i have not been oh. so that's yep. fun uh, my books are available in your country there actually i had a, a reader in japan send me a copy of her book um in uh in japan I'm like whoa that's awesome. <laughs> Japan's on my bucket list. Glad to know my words made it there, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, it's on Amazon. It's also um, on Audible. Uh, it's an audio book read by me. And uh, that was a hell of a project. But uh, I was going to say, how did you feel about, I mean, obviously you, you've got a lot of confidence and self-belief and, and you innately were good at marketing and business. And then author, how did that, you know, was it just a, a gradual... Right, so I've, I've figured this all out for myself and this seems to have worked. And now I'm just going to put this into a format. Was it just as simple as that? Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but it was messy. Like it was, I mean, nothing's ever really tidy unless you're a sociopath, like, and you just don't care and you have no feelings. That is clearly not me. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, even though I, um, you know, managed to sort out these things. And I did master these six habits. It doesn't mean that there weren't other areas of my life that needed some, you know, support. And anytime I face something new, um, I actually have all of my old habits trying desperately to come back and screw with me. So I have to remain ever vigilant um, to make sure that I don't slip back into my old ways of being that didn't serve me. I mean, writing a book, I never did that before. The most I ever wrote was like a, a long blog. Um, but I, I apparently have become much more loquacious as I've gotten older. So 55,000 words, I got this. <laughs> um, you know, publishing it was uh, quite a process. I mean, from, uh, from the time that I wrote down the, the first little piece of information and my research on an index card to actually holding a book in my hand. That was a long time. That was like almost two full years. I had to learn patience. Patience is a virtue and I am not virtuous. Um, I just, 
man, I wrote, I, I really like, I've always lived in like masculine energy. I don't know if you know of masculine energy versus feminine energy yeah, yeah. Me and feminine energy. We were not friends. The idea of surrender. I was like, Nope, rather cut my arm off. Thanks. But no, thanks. Except, um, everything that I went through taught me a different way of being. Um, it taught me to be more patient. It taught me to allow things to unfold to, instead of just doing things quickly, because I've always done things quickly. Um, even in business, like I'm going to go out and I'm going to close that contract and I would, and then I would like wrap up the whole deal in like three weeks. This took like two years. Um, I applied for the Ted talk before I really felt ready, but I felt worthy, you know, and they're very different things. I was just like, well, my idea is solid. And I know that I'm a good speaker and I know that I have something powerful to talk about, but do I, see, do I feel famous enough? Um, well-known enough to earn a spot on the stage? No, screw it. I'm going to apply anyway. <laughs> so, um, I applied to a few and um, I was invited to speak at one and that's all you need. And it was great. I always wanted to do that, but you know, sometimes you just got to be willing to put yourself out there before you really feel ready or worthy. And I think that's really been a lot of one of my, I guess, success secrets is, you know, fake it till you make it. And if you don't feel ready, do it anyway. Yeah. Um, cause you're never going to be ready. I mean, I, I think a lot of parents would probably agree with that sentiment. You're never going to be ready. You just got to do it. Exactly. Yeah. I've given birth to businesses. Other people have given birth to humans. That's one thing I haven't done. So. Okay. Thank you. And in terms of um, the coaching that you're doing, <clears throat> how was that just a natural progression from, you know, getting, getting your shit together, getting these habits, getting it all down into a book. And then, like you said, you wanted to share it and share it with other people. Um, and who, who is it that you work with? So it, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's, there's actually, you bring to mind like this, this kind of interesting situation. There's, there's three types of coaches out there. There's the ones who have been trained, but have no experience. There's the ones who have experience and no training. And then there's the folks that have both. Um, I am in the second group where I have all the experience, but haven't gone through any sort of coaching certification. And depending on the person that you're talking to, some people insist on certification and they don't care about experience. Some people want both and some people just only want experience. And the people who value the experience and really don't care either way about the certification are people who really love working with me. Um, and I love working with them too, because they're not bound by rules and structure. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to do big, bold stuff, you and rules are not really friends. So, um, I tend to work with a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of emerging thought leaders actually. Um, and I really love working with them. Um, first of all, I've been counseling business owners for 22 years on business matters and being able to layer in all of the mental stuff actually makes my work and my consulting practice much richer because when I start working with entrepreneurs, I have over two decades of acumen to bring to the table. I can, you know, help with very complicated business problems. Um, you know, you want to, you know, make your company go public, fine. You want an exit strategy, fine. You want to build a sales team, fine. You want to figure out like your entire, like, um, marketing plan, or, you know, how are you going to retire? How are you going to bring on, you know, stockholders? How are you going to do this? Like I'm a master at figuring out the how, but being able to actually layer in all the stuff that makes a person who they need to be in order to do the strategic stuff. That's the magic I love the most. So what's funny is when people start to work with me and they're like, Laura, will you be my coach? Blah, 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 blah. It always starts from a business perspective because I work with stubborn people who like to think they've completely got all their shit figured out, but they just need strategic help. And then usually about the third meeting and it's like, oh yeah, just, I'm, I'm going to poke on something that's going to hurt a little bit. <laughs> oh God, I am insecure. I knew it. And let's fix it. So you can do even bigger, bolder stuff. Oh my God. I do hate myself. Oh my God. I didn't realize. Okay. Let's fix that. So what I'm doing is helping people to expose their vulnerabilities to themselves and then 
address those, fortify those areas along with the business strategic stuff. And it's honestly a really fantastic blend. So I have room for precisely two clients in my roster. And um, if anyone wants to coach with me, they can just go to my website, check it out, shoot me a note, uh, write me a lengthy email. I will read the whole damn thing and reply and everything. I just, uh, I like to work with motivated folks who are so ready to do things differently and better, be richer, happier, healthier, you know, you can have all of it, but the struggle is optional. <laughs> cool. Um, well, at, well, at the end, we can, um, you can say where people can find you. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Um, it's, certainly, it's certainly inspirational. I mean, to be so young and to achieve what you've done and, and like you say, retired, albeit you wanted to retire at 32, it took you a bit longer. Um, but now you've moved into something so much more purposeful and something that sounds like it lights you up more um, than certainly, you know, the life you've been living for the last few years anyway. So, um, so thank you very much. And remind us what your book is, but also I, I like to finish um, with some pearls of wisdom from you, really. You know, for any listeners that are sitting here listening to this, thinking, yeah, I'd love to do my own business. I'd love to start something, but I just have no idea. You know, I'm too scared. I have no idea where to start. What would you sort of... Sure. What would you say? So um, <clears throat> people can find me if you go to the sixhabits.com. Um, it's the S I X habits.com. And the name of my book is you guessed it, the six habits. <laughs> you can, you can find that on Amazon or on audible. Um, however, however, <laughs> Jeff Bezos has enough money. True. I'm just going to say it. So if Very you buy true. directly from the author, I think I earn a, like an extra 50 cents. So, you know, look it up. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm all I'm all for bypassing Amazon these days. So cool. Unfortunately, Amazon is my publisher, so they're still getting their pound of flesh. <laughs> but you know, if you buy it directly from the author, I always sign it when I actually mail out the books myself. Which, believe me, I love going to the post office with a stack of books and all signed. I love you. Thank you for supporting an independent author. Yeah, it's super cool. So um, there's the six habits.com, the s i x habits.com. There's also um, so if you, if you get the book, you'll notice that it's actually loaded with a bunch of like complimentary uh, coaching stuff. There's a bunch of like workbooks and exercises in there. You just go online and download. It didn't fit space-wise in the book because it's not large enough um, paper-wise. Um, but these are the things that really help you to like know yourself and really understand perhaps why you don't treat yourself really well and, and where it came from and who originated that and where, you know, like, where are you like checked out? Where are you distracted? Like the more you can identify your blind spots and the more you can actually do something about it. So there's loads of free empowerment tools. Um, there's a, there's a habit mastery thing that's available, but I always recommend people read the book first. You can find out about that on the six habits as well. Um, and then pearls of wisdom, hang on pearls. <laughs> Uh, so I could give you the same one that I give a lot of people who ask me this question and I will, but I'll see if I can give you something unique. So the advice that I like to give, um, most often is, um, if you ever want your life to go better, one of the most important things you'll ever do is to work on yourself. That's a gift that never, ever, ever expires. It will always pay you in dividends over time. Um, but, uh, especially entrepreneurs, if you really want your business to be more successful, invest in yourself as a human first and how you think, because then you'll make better decisions. You'll be a better leader. You'll have more courage. Maybe you'll make more cold calls, but working on yourself is one of the best things you can do. So I thought of a, a, a different piece of advice. Listen to your body. Mm. This is, this, this is some advice that I've only like, um, been bashed over the head with about 5,000 times in the last couple of years. Um, but when your body is like telling you things, listen, and, and a lot of times we confuse um, common for normal. So if it's common that you sleep only five hours a night, don't confuse it for normal. It might not be. It could be that you are just um, very depleted, um, but you're too stressed out to be truly rested. Um, you know, perhaps you're noticing that you're irritable or you're just constantly exhausted or that your stomach hurts or you know, not to say something gross, but 
maybe you're having diarrhea all the time. Like if, if your body is just doing some funky stuff, whatever the funky stuff is, even like for me, I noticed that like when, um, I'm, I'm very, very stressed out and I'm, I'm eating foods that I have a little bit of a reaction to my eyes get extremely red right around, right around the, um, lash line. Um, but when I'm rested and it's, and I'm avoiding things that I'm like sensitive to my skin looks great. So like, think about this. If your body is not performing optimally, something is wrong and stress can kill you. I believe my, I, I was definitely on the slippery slope and heading downhill fast. You can, um, you can see stress show up in your skin. You can see hormonal imbalance brought on by stress, um, showing up in acne, uh, your hair will fall out. Um, you know, like menopausal, um, symptoms in women and feeling discomfort. Those are common. They're not normal. Um, I mean, there's lots and lots of things. I mean, skin drying, there's a lot of different things that you might be like, oh, it's climate. Oh, it's this. Are you sure? Don't yeah. take things for granted. Listen to your body. Your body is so intelligent and so wise. And most of the time your body is telling you, I'm not happy. Something you're doing while you're awake is making things harder for me to work for you mm. and keep you alive. Yeah. So listen to your body. Okay, cool. Well, definitely pearls of wisdom. Thank you, Laura. And thank you so much um, for giving me your time. I know the listeners are going to love this episode and I wish you all the very best in whatever you achieve next, um, because I'm <laughs> sure there's going to be more. Um, and obviously I will put your details in the show notes so people can come and find you. Thank you. This has thank been fun. So yeah. Thank you.